If you're like us, you've probably seen references to something called Munchausen's by proxy and been curious without really understanding what it is or how it may affect people. That's why we were excited to hear about the new podcast, Nobody Should Believe Me. The host, novelist Andrea Dunlop, takes an in-depth look at this subject. No one has ever done this before. She talks with people who have been affected by this condition. She even speaks with a perpetrator. We've already listened to the first two episodes, and we can tell you that Andrea doesn't dwell on the darkness. She takes great pains not to be gory or exploitative. This show has heart. It focuses on the humanity of everyone involved. And what makes this podcast extra special is that Andrea has a deeply personal connection to this subject. Someone very close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy. That gives the show a real emotional punch. When Andrea is listening to people tell stories about how they've been affected by this condition, she is not some uninvolved outsider. She has lived through the very same pain they have. She understands them. And through this podcast, she helps all of us understand them too. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of violence and murder. On a rainy Friday afternoon in early autumn, Annie and I drove out to Shelby County, Indiana, so we could hunt for documents in the Shelbyville courthouse. So many documents and files in the Burgershev case remain top secret. As far as we know, only one person outside of law enforcement has actually gotten the chance to read the case file. And we will tell you all about that situation next week. The rest of us have to make do with whatever Indiana State Police officials decide to share with the public. And, as you will see, sometimes what they choose to let us know is highly selective and carefully designed to strengthen whatever theory they may happen to hold. But there are other sources for at least some of the files in this case. That's where court records come into play. Alan Pruitt's witness statement, for instance, is in the Indiana State Police case file, which they don't allow us to see. But I found a copy of it lying hidden in a courthouse folder. And so we shared that statement with you last year. Earlier this autumn, we were searching for information on one of the robbery gang members. In the past, police officials like ISP investigators Ken York and Stoney Van gave this man nicknames like Amigo or Shotgun Man. His real name is Greg Steinke. He is still alive. Before the Burger Chef murders, he is known to have been found guilty of a felony involving discharging a firearm. But we couldn't find the details of what that felony actually was. So we went to Shelbyville to find it. Was that crime essentially a prequel to the Burger Chef murders? or something completely unrelated. Today, we will share with you what we learned. We will also share with you some information we found in Steinke's federal case file, which we obtained from the National Archives in Chicago. We discovered in that file a statement we feel certain Indiana State Police Investigator Ken York didn't think anyone would ever see. But does it strengthen the case against the robbers or weaken it? My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenley. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. We are continuing the multi part look into the Burger Chef murders we began last year. Each week is part of our mini series, You Never Can Forget. We will be presenting you with new information and context on what happened. We don't just rely on what we've been told or what we've read. We have worked this case ourselves. We decided to do this podcast so we can tell you what we've learned and even clear up a few misconceptions. We're the murder sheet, and this is The Gang.
last week we told you a bit about Robbery Crew member Tim Piccioni. Let's start this episode by introducing you to another gang member, Greg Steinke. Like Piccioni, Steinke is still alive. And, like Piccioni, Steinke declined our offer to comment on this episode. In fact, he did not even respond to our letter. Steinke and Piccioni go way back. They joined the Navy together back in 1971, and they still seem to be acquainted with each other. As recently as this past summer, Piccioni left a comment on a June 1st news story about a 19-year-old getting arrested for a stabbing. Another punk off the streets, he wrote. Underneath this comment, Steinke ungrammatically added, maybe we will get lucky and sentence him to death. It seems ironic that two men with such extensive criminal backgrounds take such a tough-on-crime approach today. In any case, after enlistment, Piccioni and Steinke got sent to separate branches. At least, that's the language used in Steinke's pre-sentencing report. We're not entirely sure what it means for their military careers. Either way, Steinke looked Piccioni up after he was discharged from the Navy in 1973. According to Steinke, Piccioni got an idea. Piccioni had worked for a contractor who was building a garage at a house in Shelby County, Indiana. While working there, Piccioni learned that the homeowner had a 44 Magnum pistol. Why shouldn't they just go over there and steal it? That apparently sounded like a good idea, so on January 7, 1974, they grabbed a friend of theirs named Terry Bartley and headed out. A fourth man, Keith Jackson, went along as a driver. Piccioni and Bartley were well prepared for trouble. Piccioni carried an Omega 32 caliber revolver, and Bartley had a 25 caliber automatic. The crew parked near the house and got out of their car. Piccioni described what happened next in a statement he gave to police that Kevin will read from. We was almost sure there was nobody home. The garage door was open, and there was no cars, no lights were on whatsoever in the house, in the kitchen, or otherwise. Nothing was moving. We knocked on the door first before we entered. We just turned the doorknob and it was unlocked. Went in like that. We found a rifle rack that had several shotguns and several rifles on it. And I believe we picked up about three of them and laid them on the bed. And we looked around in there for a few minutes and then went into the kitchen, and then right into the living room, and bedroom. We pulled all the drawers out of the chest of drawers, looking for that 44. The men were still ransacking the house when they heard the sound of a car pulling into the driveway. The woman of the house was returning. Piccioni continues his story. We seen her coming, so we dropped two rifles and picked up one rifle and headed for the front of the house. As we went through the kitchen, I grabbed the telephone cord and yanked the telephone out so that it would give us more time, so that she would have to leave to call the police instead of being able to make the call right there. I went into the front room where I met Terry and Greg. They were trying to get the door open, but for some reason they were having a problem with the door. Couldn't get it open. We ran out the front door and down the hill and entered into the woods. As we ran, we dropped some of the stuff that we took from the house. Like the rifle was too big to be carrying, so Terry dropped the rifle, and they just dropped parts of stuff that we had. Some of it was intentionally dropped, and some of it wasn't. Law enforcement quickly picked up all four men and recovered the trail of stolen items they had left behind them in their hapless attempt to flee. Steinke ended up getting convicted for his role in this. This relates to the Burger Chef case because, a few days after the murders, Steinke was arrested and prosecutors soon filed three charges against him. One count of being a felon in possession of an unregistered firearm. One count of having received an unregistered firearm. And one count of receiving an unregistered firearm with no serial number. This would give law enforcement leverage with Steinke. They offered to reduce the firearm charges if he would cooperate with them on Burger Chef. But it didn't work. He didn't work with them and ended up serving time on the firearm charges. At least, that's what Ken York told WTHR. 
When we got Stanky's file, we didn't see anything in it about any offers for leniency in exchange for cooperating on the Burger Chef murders case. We did see, however, that two of the three charges against Stanky were dropped. That gives us the impression York may have exaggerated the facts. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's talk about the robbery gang theory. And let's do what no one else has done. Let's publicly name all of the people in the gang. The robbery gang theory was largely developed by Ken York and Richard Bumps, both of whom worked the case for the Indiana State Police in the late 70s and early 80s. The theory was later adopted by Stoney Vann, who took over the case for the Indiana State Police in the late 90s and remained in charge of the case for close to 20 years. York, who died in 2010, gave several press interviews to outlets like the Franklin Daily Journal, and WTHR, in which he outlined the theory in some detail. Before he retired in 2017, Van spoke with the press in broad terms about the theory. But, after leaving the force, he would go into the theory in far more detail on the opening episodes of 1041, a podcast hosted by his friend and former state police colleague, Todd McComas. Let's begin then by sharing with you the theory as those men have themselves shared it with the public. Please don't take any of the assertions we are about to make as settled fact. Just consider them the prosecution's case for these men to be the murderers in the Burger Chef case. We'll be explaining the entire robbery gang theory as it's been presented in the media and to the public. Then we'll be raising a few problems that we have with this theory based on affidavits we've recently uncovered, as well as basic common sense. The robbery gang supposedly had five members. To make things easier for people who have also heard 1041, we will give you not only the names of the men, but also the nicknames Van assigned to them on that program. Here are the members. Gregory Steinke, who Van referred to on 1041 as Amigo. He's still alive. Timothy Piccioni, who Van called Inside Man. He's also still alive. John Deffenbaugh, who Van called Mini Mart. He was shot and murdered in 2004 in a crime that remains unsolved. David Cathcart, who Van called Bar Rat. He committed suicide in 1983. S.W. Wilkins, who Van called Dog Catcher. He died after having a heart attack in 1984. These men made a specialty of robbing burger chefs. This was because Piccioni's wife worked at a burger chef and had inadvertently passed along crucial inside information about the restaurant's closing procedures. Information which the gang shrewdly used in order to commit their robberies. Their technique was to pull a gun on a night shift worker who was taking out the trash, force the employee back inside, empty the cash register, and then flee. That's exactly what our source Michael told us about his brush with the robbers in last week's episode. And this method seemed similar to what must have happened to the Speedway Burger Chef. The back door of that place was found unlocked. Several containers of trash were just inside, and about $500 had been stolen from the registers and the restaurant safe. A day after the four employees were abducted from the Speedway Burger Chef, a man named David Cathcart visited a bar in nearby Greenwood, Indiana, a suburb in Johnson County that borders the south side of Indianapolis. He told the startled patrons there that he had been involved in the robbery of another burger chef and that the four Speedway employees would soon be found safe and sound, in the country. After the bodies of the four victims were discovered near Greenwood, people in the bar reported Cathcart's comments to the police. Ken York and Richard Bumps tracked him down and interviewed him. He said he had not been involved in the Speedway Burger Chef robbery, but he was part of a group that was robbing a lot of other burger chefs. Cathcart went on to explain that he and Steinke had met up in Franklin, Indiana on the night of the murders and impulsively decided that night 
to go and rob a burger chef on the east side of Indianapolis. But their efforts came to nothing because there happened to be a police car sitting in that restaurant's parking lot. By this time, Cathcart, who had never participated in a robbery before, had grown so nervous that he drank quite a bit and became drunk. In fact, he was so intoxicated that he could not participate in any robbery. So Steinke drove him back down to Franklin, picked up two other members of the gang, and headed off to the Speedway Burger Chef. Curious, York went to talk with Steinke, who was wanted on a weapons charge. To his surprise, he saw Steinke's next-door neighbor mowing his lawn. The neighbor, S.W. Wilkins, had a beard and looked exactly like a bearded man a witness had reported seeing behind the Speedway Burger Chef just before the abductions. He asked Wilkins to come in for a lineup, and Wilkins did so. But first, he shaved off his beard, the first time he had done so in five years. That did not succeed in hiding his appearance. Later, the female witness from the burger chef would identify Wilkins as the man she saw that night. Wilkins' own son would also later implicate Wilkins in the murder. He revealed that he once overheard his father and Steinke talk about going to a burger chef in Speedway. They said something about a robbery and a couple of people getting killed. Wilkins' participation in the robbery is theorized to have been what potentially caused the crime to turn into murder. Wilkins had previously worked in Plainfield, Indiana. His route home from work would have taken him right past the Plainfield Burger Chef, where future Burger Chef murder victim Jane Freet worked at the time. Perhaps she got to know him as a regular. If so, she may have recognized him when he entered the Speedway Burger Chef to rob it, and she needed to be killed so she could not be a witness. There's one more thing. Steinke's own attorney on the weapons charge came forward to police with incriminating information about his client. At some point, this lawyer went to law enforcement to share some information he had gotten while representing Steinke. The attorney revealed there were seven people inside the burger chef at the time, presumably the four victims and three others. He said Wilkins was involved in the murders and that Steinke had cased the Speedway burger chef in preparation for robbing it on three straight nights before the murders. Taken together, all of those points make for a very powerful circumstantial case. But how much of what York and Van have been telling us about this case is actually true? Before we get started, we just wanted to say that we respect Todd McComas and the work he's done on 1041. We do take this robbery gang theory very seriously, but that means we want to drill down and talk about some of the problems with it. Let's go back to the very beginning. Yes. Most of the five people named by York and the others were indeed participants in a string of robberies in the late 70s. But it doesn't seem quite fair or accurate to say they specialized in burger chefs. They also robbed places like Kentucky Fried Chicken. We told you last week about an instance in which they robbed a Magic Market convenience store. Stoney Van claims that Steinke and Piccioni gave so-called cleanup statements in which they admitted to up to 30 instances of robbery and home invasions. We can't confirm that. We've not been given access to those statements. According to Van, the duo admitted that between July and October of 1978, they robbed five burger chefs and one Kentucky Fried Chicken. He didn't specify how many home invasions they pulled off during that time. Van also did not explain what the other up to 24 robberies were, or why he only seemed to be counting robberies from July to October of 1978. We know, for instance, that Deffenbaugh robbed a convenience store in 1977. Van even claimed that Steinke was the getaway driver in that crime. Why didn't that crime make the list? In doing basic research, We also found that a Kentucky Fried Chicken near the county line between Marion and Johnson County, Indiana, was robbed in May of 1978. 
The details in this robbery were printed in the paper, and it sounded very much like the other robberies known to be committed by the gang. Why didn't Van include the May 1978 robberies on his list? We suspect it may be because the more you look at the crimes known to be committed by these men, the less it looks like they specifically targeted burger chefs. Sure, they robbed burger chefs, but they also robbed Kentucky Fried Chickens and convenience stores and did home invasions. These men targeted any place they thought they could steal something and get away with it. It is also not at all clear what sort of so-called inside information about Burger Chef these robbers would have needed or gotten from Piccioni's wife in order to pull off their crimes. Remember, these were not intricate heists pulled off by master thieves. Their big move was to hang around outside a place until it was almost empty, which was usually around closing time. At that point, someone would eventually come out alone to take trash to the dumpster. These robbers would put a gun to their head and force their way into the restaurant. Do you really need inside information to pull that off? I actually worked for Pizza Hut back in the early 90s. In those days, around closing time, someone would invariably go out alone to empty the trash. It was common practice. You did not need inside information to predict it. What the robbery gang theorists have done on these points is to shade and finesse the facts in order to make those facts sound as incriminating as possible for the members of the robbery gang. As we shall see, it will not be the last time they have done so. We come now to the tale of David Cathcart going to a bar in Greenwood, Indiana, and shooting his mouth off about being involved in a Burger Chef robbery. It is not at all clear what exactly Cathcart actually said that night. Only one person outside of law enforcement has had the opportunity to read the files that would reveal that sort of information. All we have is what men like Ken York and Stoney Van have told us, he said and they've changed their stories. On the 1041 podcast, Van said that Cathcart made some statements that the four missing employees would be found safe. Ken York, on the other hand, told WTHR that Cathcart said he, Cathcart, had committed the murders. York told the Franklin Daily Journal that Cathcart just bragged about being involved in a Burger Chef robbery. We honestly don't know which of these versions is true. Your guess is as good as ours. But we do know exactly what Cathcart later told police. We know this because we have the statement Cathcart gave law enforcement on November 22, 1978. We got it from the National Archives in Chicago, a government repository of public documents. There it lay hidden in the middle of some court records pertaining to Steinke. We were even told that the file was slated for destruction in the very near future, so we are lucky that we got it before that happened. We now share the contents of the Cathcart affidavit for the first time with the public, and afterwards, we will discuss whether or not York and the others gave a fair summary of its contents. Kevin will read Cathcart's words from his statement. I, David Cathcart, am 21 years of age, and reside in Greenwood, Indiana with my parents. I have never been convicted of a felony or served a sentence in a penal institution. On Friday, November 17, 1978, the night of the Burger Chef murders, at approximately 7 p.m., I went by the residence of Greg Steinke in Franklin, Indiana. While at Steinke's residence, he asked me if I wanted to go pull a job, meaning hold up a place. I told him that I would, so we left in my car, a 1971 Monte Carlo, two-door, green in color, and drove to the east side of Indianapolis. Before we left Steinke's residence, he went upstairs and got a shotgun. The shotgun was approximately 20 inches in length overall, with a 10-inch barrel. The stock had been cut down to form a pistol grip, and I think it was either a 20 or 410 gauge. The shotgun was also bolt action and had a blue steel finish. I saw this shotgun once again in Steinke's residence on Saturday, November 18, 1978. Steinke has also carried a 38 caliber revolver before, and I have seen this revolver in his car, which is a 1967 green Buick. 
As Steinke and I drove towards the east side of Indianapolis, he told me about some robberies that he'd committed with a friend of his named Tim. He told me about one burger chef they had sat on for hours. I'm not sure, but I think this one was at 10th and Arlington. We cased this burger chef for a while, and even getting out of the car on foot and approached the restaurant on foot. Steinke had carried the shotgun with him. However, he told me he was cold, and we would come back the next night wearing warmer clothes. Steinke at one time went through the fence and up to the door of the burger chef and listened through the door. He said he couldn't hear anything, and there are still a lot of people in there, so we decided to leave. At this time, we went to a second burger chef located at Emerson and Southeastern Avenue, and we parked on the side street and watched it for a while. However, there was an Indianapolis police car on the lot, and the officer was inside, so we decided to leave. Snikey told me when he and Tim did their robberies, they would wait for everyone to leave, and when the manager would leave, they would grab him and take him back inside, get the money, tie him up with a rope, and leave. They wore stocking masks during their robberies. Snikey and I cased these two burger chefs Friday, November the 17th, and Saturday, November the 18th, 1978. On the night of November the 18th, 1978, Steinke got the sawed-off shotgun from upstairs and was looking for ammunition in a downstairs closet. I have seen Steinke in possession of the aforementioned shotgun approximately three times in his residence within the past ten days. I am sure this residence is Steinke's because I have visited him there many times. I have witnessed him eating there, sleeping there, and he recently married a girl who was living there with him. Her first name is Debbie. However, I don't know her maiden name. She is pregnant, and I believe this is the reason they got married. That Cathcart statement does not at all line up with what York claimed it said. He said, you will recall, that Cathcart and Steinke had gone off to rob a place on the east side. They actually tried to rob two places on the east side. York claimed the east side robbery didn't occur because Cathcart was drunk. But the real problem according to Cathcart, was that Steinke got cold. York told the press that after dropping Cathcart off in Franklin, Steinke went off with the others to rob the Speedway Burger Chef. There is absolutely nothing in the statement about Steinke going off to commit another robbery after leaving Cathcart. We don't know where York got that from. York also, of course, maintained that he had checked all the driving times and he learned that they added up. That, in other words, Steinke had the time to do all the driving Cathcart says he did and still make it to Speedway in time to rob the burger chef. But is that true? Let's see if we can figure that out. George Nichols and Mary Ryan, the two teen witnesses who saw the bearded and clean-shaven suspects behind the burger chef, estimated that that encounter took place sometime around 11.15 or 11.30 p.m. Let's also remember that in a March 6, 1979 story, Indianapolis Star journalist Patrick Morrison reported that state police investigators had confirmed that the men in the sketches were believed to have been inside the Speedway Burger Chef a full two hours before the abductions, and that they had cased the place a half dozen times that night. That would have had the two men at the Speedway Burger Chef no later than 9.30 p.m. According to Cathcart, he and Steinke met at Steinke's home in Franklin, Indiana, around 7 p.m. At some point after that, Steinke pitched the idea of robbing a Burger Chef. At that point, the two set off for a Burger Chef at 10th and Arlington in Indianapolis. Google Maps says that is about a 32-minute drive. Cathcart says they were there for a while. Afterwards, they went to the Burger Chef at Emerson and Southeastern Avenue in Indianapolis. That's a seven-minute drive. Cathcart says they parked and watched it for a while. They then returned to Franklin. That would have been a 29-minute drive. In Franklin, Steinke is alleged to have rounded up two members of the gang and to have set off for the Speedway Burger Chef, which would have been at least a 40-minute drive. 
that is a total of one hour and 48 minutes of driving. So yes, if they left at 7 p.m., they would indeed have had time to drive all over Indianapolis, hang around outside two different burger chefs, return to Franklin, and then make it to Speedway by 9.30 p.m. But is that probable? Remember, this crew liked to rob places at or around closing time. Why would they have left Franklin at 7 p.m. to drive off to commit a robbery that couldn't plausibly have occurred for another four hours? Next, York claimed that Wilkins was the bearded man outside the restaurant that night and that he shaved his beard for the first time in five years when York asked him to come in for a lineup. That assertion, we can say, is absolutely 100% false. Researcher Steve Hughes found a picture of Wilkins that appeared in the Franklin Daily Journal on April 5, 1978, just seven months before the murders. Wilkins was clean-shaven, so York was either mistaken or out-and-out lying. Van told the audience of the 1041 podcast that the female witness, Mary Ryan, looked through a mug book and identified a photo of Wilkins as the man she saw outside the restaurant that night. This one gets a bit complicated. We wrote to Mary and asked her flat out if she ever made such an identification. Anya will read what Mary wrote back. I don't think I did at the time. There are several pics that look like it could be them, but I can't say for sure about any of them. So, she seemed to flat out deny identifying Wilkins. But, in a subsequent phone interview, which we will share with you in a few weeks, she walked that back and said it is possible she did. Without looking at the original police reports, we can't make a solid determination about what she did or did not tell police decades ago. And, as we keep repeating, only one person outside of law enforcement has received the chance to look at those reports. The tale York and Van tell about Wilkins' son supposedly overhearing his father and Steinke confess to their involvement in the murders is something else that can only be verified by looking at the original reports. We can say, however, that since we have started researching this case, several different people have contacted us about overhearing friends or relatives make incriminating statements about these murders. None of those leads ever panned out. So we view this claim with some skepticism. While we're on the subject of Wilkins and his son, let's bring up something else. Both men shared the same name, S.W. Wilkins. And so some people theorize that York made a huge mistake. That he implicated Wilkins the Elder when the real man involved with the robbery crew was Wilkins the Younger. We first heard this theory from a researcher who is no longer active on this case. The arguments for this would be that Wilkins Jr. was much closer in age to Picayoni and Steinke than his father, and that Wilkins Jr. was in fact later implicated in several burglaries. If you take this theory to the extreme, one would suppose that Wilkins Jr. lied about hearing Wilkins Sr. implicate himself in the Burger Chef killings, because Wilkins Jr. wanted to hide his own complicity in the murders. We guess this would mean that the bearded man York saw mowing the lawn was actually Wilkins Jr., and that Wilkins Sr. came in for the lineup later, and that York somehow did not notice the substitution. All of this, frankly, seems a bit hard to believe. But in fairness, quite a few documented facts about this case also seem implausible at first glance. And York certainly made some big mistakes so we feel this possibility cannot be totally dismissed at this time. The story about Jane recognizing Wilkins because he was a regular at the Plainfield Burger Chef where she worked has frankly always seemed far-fetched to us. No one, after all, has ever produced any evidence that Wilkins stopped at that place even once, let alone that he was a regular there. In examining the court records from Wilkins' divorce, we also learned that he worked nights. His shifts started at 11 p.m. 
This would seem to make it less likely that he would stop at a burger chef on his way to or from work. Though, of course, we realize that sometimes people's work schedules can change. Finally, we come to the story about Steinke's attorney. This lawyer supposedly told police that Steinke had cased the Speedway burger chef three nights in a row prior to the robbery murders. According to court records, Steinke actually had three attorneys during this period. John Lawson, Theodore Koch, and Joseph Reisberg. All three men are deceased. It is unclear which of them supposedly made these statements to police. For what it's worth, we reached out to the families of all three men. We heard back from one of Lawson's relatives, who, unfortunately, didn't have any information about Burger Chef to share with us. It is also not clear how this story makes the least bit of sense. Why would they need to case the place three nights in a row to commit a simple robbery? What sort of information could they get from casing the place, say, on a Tuesday, that would still be relevant on a Friday? And if Steinke was casing the place all week and decided to rob a burger chef on Friday, then why on earth did he take Cathcart to a different burger chef on the other side of town instead of driving with him to the location he'd been keeping under such careful observation all week? This story just doesn't seem to make sense. We would also argue that the robbery gang theory, at least in the way that it has been presented to the public, does not make sense. There may be some truth to the theory in some form, but the way York and Van have offered it simply does not hold water. When we have tested their claims against court documents, their assertions have been found wanting. That makes us wonder if what they have told the public falls apart when you get the chance to look at court files, would other claims also crumble if we got a chance to compare them to the actual case record? How can anyone evaluate the performance of the Indiana State Police on this case without getting the chance to look at those files. Well, as we keep saying, only one person outside of law enforcement ever got the chance to look at those confidential files. And the end result was an embarrassing disaster that continues to reverberate to this day. Next week, we will tell you the story of Ashley Flowers, Bill Dalton, and Red Ball. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at M Sheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, Please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.